We all hope for a peaceful future. But if not, I think we could settle for a future where we went to battle in giant robots to fight huge alien bug monsters or endless legions of android killbots. So welcome back to another Sci-Fi Sunday here on SFIA, and I'm your host, Isaac Arthur. Today's topic is a popular one in science fiction, the notion of either robot battlesuits or drones, or automated tanks, fighter jets, and so on. It is worth noting that this is not just sci-fi anymore, we've been using robots in our wars this entire century, and even a bit before, and with increasingly greater usage and wider roles. So I thought we would look both at the modern and near future options, and more distant future options. Some years back we did a look at the topic of giant robots and power suits to examine the basic idea of people wearing powered armor or piloting big robots, but I felt that could use some updates, and more detailed looks, which we'll be doing both today and next Thursday in our Dropships episode. But it's not really terribly likely that would be the main role of robots on the battlefield, as some combat suit or vehicle, which is a good place to begin. For every soldier or combat unit you've got in an actual combat role with guns and armor, you've got the robots doing field support activities, recon, or even back home building your equipment. Robots in factories are already a game changer in warfare because they allow the ultra high precision manufacturing and high speeds that not only allows for the best battlefield equipment, but also the robust economies and infrastructure that permit you to field large numbers of units, and elite units at that. It is entirely possible we might see a future in which nations have signed treaties banning the use of autonomous armed drones, or even robots as weapons platforms for remote control. Indeed, fear of artificial intelligence running amok is often the reason given for why a given sci-fi setting has humans doing the piloting and fighting, and we've looked at that topic more in our Machine Rebellions episode. In that case, then maybe your robots aren't charging the enemy's trenches, or maybe they still are, they're just heavily armored shields for your infantry to advance behind. And amusingly, at least in the short term of the next few decades, while robots are still new, few, and finicky, we might opt for using our robots in factories and using the people who would otherwise man those factories to fight those wars. Eventually you presumably use your robots to make more robots for production and combat. Though a civilization that replaces humans with robots in all capacities is at a risk of replacing humans with robots in all capacities, potentially reducing humans to pets or historical footnotes. And we are hardly ignorant of that scenario, so as we see further use of robots in many walks of life, more and more serious and sober conversation is being had about placing limits on them. And no place is better exemplified than in combat situations, which includes both battlefields and law enforcement. I'm not sure how most of us would feel about getting arrested by an android, probably no better than being killed by one in combat, but you sort of expect the enemy soldiers to be rather cold and indifferent to your life, whereas police are your own community, ideally. So while there's a lot of talk about whether or not you could give a drone or battle bot the actual authority to pick a target and pull a trigger, we do need to be mindful that it's not just a case of robots having permission to use lethal force. We are also talking about scenarios where a robot might be arresting someone too, or detaining a prisoner of war, or determining if hostile non-uniformed persons were over the threshold to fire on, and for that matter, if the target is actually a human or not, or if it could shoot apparently hostile robots, ones that maybe looked a bit human. We should also rule out any serious use of Isaac Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics as anything more than a loose mental guide, especially for battle bots. In his classic robot novels, Asimov lays out three laws preventing robots from harming us or letting us be harmed, to obey us and not to let themselves be harmed, and Rule 2, Obedience, supersedes 3, so you can order a robot to shoot itself, while Rule 1 supersedes 2 and 3, so you can't order a robot to shoot you or someone else, or to stand idly by while someone shot you or someone else. Needless to say, that's a real pain in the neck if you're trying to fight a battle and your own war machines keep trying to disarm you. We've discussed the flaws and problems there before, as have many other thinkers. Robert Miles from Computer File did a great look at the problems with it some years back, and of course Asimov himself pointed out tons of the problems with them, 
Most of those stories were usually either about how someone did an end run around the three laws or how it had seemed someone had but in truth they had worked just fine. Soren Matai wrote an article over at Strategy Bridge a couple years back talking about the ethics of robots in combat and that petition from 2015 opposing the development of killer robots signed by thousands of scientists, scholars, and technologists, including notables like Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk. The article very appropriately references Asmo's Three Laws of Robotics and it was titled The First and Only Law of Robotic Warfare, which he states as, the more precise the war machines, the more devastating one's own losses in a pure conflict. A pure conflict is one where both combatants are more or less on the same level, peers, like having the same tech for their equipment, and if they both have brutally accurate and effective weapons, like computer-controlled weapon systems, the death toll might be very fast and terrifyingly high. So the problem is, we don't actually want a robot that follows those laws anyway, because someone can build ones that don't have those laws, or hack them and replace those laws, or just pervert them, like changing the robot's identification system for what is human to swap us with trees or cows. Asimov hand waves that in the novels by having the positronic robot brain being essentially a product of centuries of improvement piled on those three laws, so that trying to remove them would result in an unstable brain that would quickly crash, and certainly modern code is ever more buggy like that, built layer on layer of patchwork like a living being's own mind as we age and learn, but it still doesn't work. People have every motivation to find a way to build a stable AI with an ability to use lethal force, especially governments, so that if the enemy has them they're not hopelessly outclassed. So you keep the killbot files in a vault waiting doomsday to upload them to your own robots at least, so when the enemy does you have a fighting chance. That's the first rule of warfare after all, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. Ethics in warfare always get murky too, but there was another nice article by Ronald Alkin titled Ethical Robots in Warfare, in which he lists a number of common arguments and concerns about use of wartime robots, which I'll just go ahead and quote. Establishing responsibility, who's to blame if things go wrong with an autonomous robot. The threshold of entry into warfare may be lowered as we will now be risking machines and fewer human soldiers, this could violate the just ad bellum conditions of just warfare. The possibility of unilateral risk of free warfare, which could be viewed as potentially unjust. It simply can't be done right, it's just too hard for machines to discriminate targets. The effect on military squad cohesion and its impact on the fighting force. Human warfighters may not accept ethical robots monitoring their performance. Robots running amok, the classic science fiction nightmare. A robot refusing an order. The question of whether ultimate authority should vest in humans. The issue of overrides placed in the hands of immoral, irresponsible, or reckless individuals. The co-opting of an ethical robot research effort by the military to serve to justify other political agendas. The difficulty in winning the hearts and minds of civilians affected by warfare if robots are allowed to kill. Proliferation of the technology to other nations and terrorists. Some of those points Ark and Lists are harder to address than others, some we discussed in other episodes too like AI run government or machine rebellion, but I view it as a solid list for contemplating the topic and we'll try to address those points as we go, though this episode is not meant as an advocacy piece for or against using war robots. Like everyone else, I can see the many advantages and also get a queasy feeling at the thought too, though in terms of a lot of the current modern use we don't really have to worry about killer robots yet. I don't see an ethical issue either with using a robot to check out a possible bomb or scout an area, we were already using them for that when I was deployed to Iraq from 2005 to 2007 for checking out IEDs. Things get more gray after that of course, and we have no special answers to these matters today and are honestly more focused on what that technology looks like. Incidentally, we are not yet at the point that an AI controlling a drone represents a powerful threat to a normal soldier. That time will certainly come and then rapidly outclass us, but for now the big advantage of drones is they are expendable and cheap and reasonably covert. They are still expensive though, with Predator drones costing tens of millions of dollars each, and even the more modest TB2 drone from Turkey running about 5 million. I think one can make a strong argument that they're not really cost effective at this point, 
and in many applications is more about having this sleek new toy. The small nation of Togo, whose entire military budget is just over a hundred million a year, bought some of those 2BT drones. Obviously you can pick up a cheaper drone off Amazon complete with cameras way cheaper, and mounting a gun on one isn't exactly tricky, it's just banned by the FAA. Unsurprisingly, there's laws against guns being mounted on private airplanes and they added drones to that list. But it's not a big technical challenge, though aiming is harder than one might assume, and recoil is a serious issue. The Israeli drone, the Smash Dragon, can mount a sniper rifle and aim accurately, though it's a person doing the aiming. However, it's also computers doing the grunt work of keeping everything aligned. All that work with cameras and keeping them steady and focused translates well into aiming other weapons. There really isn't much stopping us from having automated machine guns, it's more that we have increasingly found with automation that it's not about making the device smart like a person, but rather to make it smart at its specific job and instead have humans trained to use it. My robot vacuum cleaner needs to be smarter than my dishwasher, but neither needs to be able to prepare my taxes. Very little brains are really needed to aim a rifle, and better than any sniper alive, and no personality or intelligence is really required for that gun bot. It only needs brains if you want to be smart about what not to target, and to get that from a conversation with its human operators. And that's where the assumed trouble and rebellion comes in. In practice though, as ChatGPT shows us, even a casual spoken or typed interface doesn't really require vast intellect. And your options for what to shoot or not shoot can probably be programmed with a far better success rate than trained soldiers or police try not to shoot the wrong target on a range that pops up bad guys and civilians and without actually needing tons of brains. We don't have that yet, but what we have found in the last couple decades of AI development is that it's almost always easier to make a vastly smaller and dumber brain designed for specific tasks, even things like that, than a general intelligence. And the thing about a general intelligence that folks tend to overlook is that they are slow. Oh, a computer brain might be faster than you or I, but a general intelligence will always do a specific job slower than an equivalent device built for one job. So we do not want a killbot with human level general intelligence because it's a threat to us, and not likely be better at its job anyway. The one with a large library of object identification that can refer iffy cases to a smarter intelligence, you or I or some general AI that lacks guns, is likely to be faster in making decisions. And this is usually where folks start contemplating various ways it might mess up and shoot the wrong person, or fire on civilians in a battlefield, and to put it rather bluntly, as a war veteran, mistakes already happen. It is not about making a machine that's incapable of error, it's about getting one that performs as well or better than a human would, and honestly a lot of times the people controlling that machine aren't going to worry about if it's even as good as a human at target identification, because the robot is expendable and their human is not. So a robot that's twice as likely to accidentally shoot an enemy civilian as one of your own soldiers would be isn't necessarily a deal breaker because you mostly want your own forces not to be shot. If you can do that by having to further endanger enemy civilians, you might consider that an easy trade. Which raises the issue of friendly fire, but that's mostly a friend foe IFF issue, and since any such robot needs to be remotely accessible, a cryptography and hacking issue and there is such a thing as an unhackable system, so if each robot has its own unique one-time pad for accessing it to give certain types of orders, like programming the current IFF parameters and the emergency off switch, that's mostly circumventing both the fear of them being hacked and of having such high level security that it's impractical for battlefield use. Ultimately the big thing to remember when contemplating security is that as scary as a rogue or enemy hacked gun drone might be, in many ways it wouldn't be much more dangerous than hacking an automated car. All the various technologies we have to prove against various hacking efforts will fall into the same general bucket. How do we make this piece of mostly automated tech easily accessed and controlled by a normal and proper human user without letting others get into it, except tech support? or possibly law enforcement or higher command in the military. Not easy problems, but more in the sense of how we best do it both fluidly and safely, so someone isn't hacking your gun drone, your car, your smartphone, your smart house, your credit card, and so on. Dismiss for now the idea of a human intelligent machine running the robots, I don't see that being necessary and I don't think we'd expect to see it much. I'm guessing anyone brave or dumb enough to throw those dice probably would go for a super intelligence instead. 
Now where we might see human intelligence or greater AI in play, and necessarily so, is at the strategic level. Though remember that computers have been able to easily beat humans at chess, which everyone used to call the ultimate game of strategy when I was a little kid, before we finished the 20th century out. Personally, while I enjoy chess and poker, I never got why everyone thought they were great analogies for life or battle. Nonetheless, there was an awful lot of strategy that really is just data sorting, risk assessment of that available data and educated guesses, and lots of other statistical calculations that computers excel at. Key thing to remember though is that the computer doesn't need real experience, so even a learning machine that's picked something clever up can have that added back in after we wipe it. Folks talk a lot about how to control or chain genuinely intelligent AI, and four key things to remember is that you can reset the AI, run a modified copy of it, download its actual brain to see what it was really thinking, and you can also pause it. So if I've got an AI I think might be a little too smart, I just turn it off when it's not actively doing its job, or dial its speed down to a crawl. You can also real-time play its thinking, or pause and download it, and make a lesser AI to run through its brain and look for thoughts like, hey, how do I kill all the humans? Critical issues for us to overcome in dealing with robots in warfare is that we tend to get off on the never-ending thought stream of, how do I make these robots completely safe? Which seems a bit of a bizarre requirement when you're designing a mortar machine, and our tendency to assume any intelligent AI we build is going to quickly overmatch us and be better at everything and outsmart any method we use to keep it in check. As we are seeing more and more, AI is definitely a thing to be taken seriously. But the boogeyman fears of them are not terribly realistic. Like everything else, they have limits and weaknesses. So your strategic computers are probably mostly dumber but powerful AI, helping you run odds and do a lot of checking. The machine might notice weaknesses or things that are standard but that you overlooked in a rush. It could also be sucking in data from 10,000 different recon drones, each with different locations and ranges, using a dozen different types of sensors, and compile that into telling you where the enemy assault was coming in and giving you a way more accurate assessment of numbers and strengths. It's not easy for a spotter to see something at the regimental or division strength level and give an accurate count, let alone a real mix of forces like how many of each tank type there are, how many howitzers, how many rifles, and so on. And yet an AI need not be anything like human intelligent to give you some real advanced and useful data like, there are 167 artillery pieces in that formation, 52 towed 105mm guns, 115 self-propelled 155mm guns, each given the following temporary identification number, and in Engagement 1 we notice that these were the 20 fastest to reload, these partially overlapping 20 were the most accurate, while those others were slow or inaccurate or showed damage, and here are the ones we deem highest priority for taking out. Give a report like that to a general even 20 years ago and he'd assume it was some super intelligent machine or crack division of recon feeding him that, or posers feeding him bull but we know that there is nothing actually sophisticated about IDing each individual battlefield asset by a number of metrics, visual patterns, distinct heat signatures or engine sounds, etc., or to have seen each volley of fire and track the rate and accuracy or the speed of the vehicles, then compiling all that. That same sort of simple AI can be doing things like determining from personnel files and guard shifts which locations on your perimeter might be your soft points needing reinforcing. If this were old school sci-fi we would have some sergeant or captain wise with experience say, I knew Johnson was on that tower, he never falls asleep on shift and stays alert, whereas Jackson is always drifting off and had two back to back shifts, so when both towers went quiet I knew the enemy must have hit Johnson's tower and Jackson was just asleep, your expensive computer didn't know that because it doesn't know people, just data. Which sounds nice for fiction, but in practice, that's actually the exact type of simple analysis that simple machines excel at. It might also be trusted to have read that whole platoon's confidential medical records, which normally a sergeant or captain would not, and might have noticed any number of minor details that would help or harm someone's performance. But in the end, a general intelligence can always do better given time on anything bizarre, especially where deceit and improvisation are concerned. We use the term human-machine teaming a lot now to emphasize how often we get best results from a human aided by an AI, rather than one or the other or two of the same kind. So our AI forwards the analysis to the watch commander, and of course it can also watch the watchers, and note that Jackson's heart rate is what we expect from someone sleeping, while Johnson's has simply stopped. 
So at the tactical level, what does this human-machine teaming look like? Well it could be akin to Jarvis and Tony Stark in Iron Man, the powered armor suit that needs a fairly sophisticated AI to coordinate with it. Or it might be the big giant robot of course. There's a lot of arguments on the pros and cons of armored vehicles shaped like tanks versus walking battle bots, with the big disadvantage of the latter being all the extra spots you need to armor. But the main one comes down to intuitive control. So folks suggest a very humanoid form as easy to control though often still show a pilot seated in a cockpit with a joystick. And the answer there is that the AI is doing most of the actual moving. Your brain is enormous and most of it is not used for complex thought, but instead for running all your motor functions and managing the swarms of data sent by all your nerves and sense organs. So here we have the AI act as an extra region of your brain, translating your desire to move into an actual motion, including balancing and such, and over time builds a nice profile to make it better. That's probably unique to each person and machine combination, but would probably be able to have a good baseline for a new pilot into a new machine. And you're not normally the one making the battlesuit duck in response to incoming fire, it is, you can just override it. It becomes like a reflex, such as flinching, and the AI does that part. Same sort of thing applies to independent drones. A person might have a whole platoon of bots accompanying them into battle, and that might range from actual assault units to something that was basically a big track on wheels with a massive metal shield or a fast armored coffin-shaped box carrying extra supplies that could rapidly dump them, grab you, close up and run to safety. One might be just a big mobile generator on wheels, or battery, or walking around on a spider leg chassis. And the person there is basically just modifying orders and adapting to anything weird. They probably are in some power armor themselves with lots of weapons, but they are in a command role telling the big walking guns to cease fire, or open fire, or get to cover. Of course that suit might be empty and the person might be in there remotely or it might be some copy of their brain loaded onto it locally, possibly sped up to computer speed not neuron and brain speed. There are a lot of options and in the millennia to come we'll probably go through many different phases here on Earth and different ones in future colonies in space. In the short term though, we will definitely see more robots on and around the battlefield, but I don't expect many to be given autonomous file control, unless maybe they are just an uploaded human mind. Those basic techs will get improved regardless, much as firefighting robots get more automated. There's also an occasional concern that we might get more reckless if we had robots doing all the dying, but the military has studied this and found that, probably unsurprisingly given the precedent of horses and canines in the surface, soldiers anthropomorphize the bots, get protective of them, get very upset when they get destroyed, and even give them unofficial medals. So, while we are likely to feel a little less worried about casualties in picking battles, because of robots, I don't see people getting utterly indifferent to those losses, nor do people hesitate to get angry about wastes of money and resources. Also, at least for the US in recent years, modern warfare has had very low casualties compared to prior conflicts and yet it was still a major issue in support for those recent wars. We should not assume nations get more belligerent simply from a lower death toll on their side, and using robots for your combatants doesn't mean the enemy has no people to shoot at they still have your manned bases and your civilian centers to shoot at. For good or ill, one thing seems sure, robots have reached the battlefield and are here to stay. I guess the bigger question will be whether or not that means humans will be leaving that battlefield, and if so, will it be because humans no longer fight and die in conflicts, or because the only conflicts being fought are between all the robots left over after they killed us all off? But that is the first rule of warfare after all, never hand someone a gun unless you're sure they won't point it at you, and the robotic corollary to that would be not to give a gun the ability to pick targets unless you're sure where they'll aim. The future of robots in warfare can take on a lot of forms, and one of the ways they're being used to attack is by stealing people's data and scamming them. This isn't always illegal either. A lot of less ethical companies sell your data to anyone who wants it, and AI has only made this harvesting and trading of your personal information easier. You are allowed to ask companies to delete their data on you and they are required to do so, but it's not very practical for a person to find everyone who has their data and send those requests and the replies to the automated responses that delay things. Fortunately, that robotic blade can cut both ways, and the folks at Incogni use their AI to find places where your personal data is being kept and send those deletion requests for you. 
All you have to do is sign up, give them permission to act on your behalf and delete data, then they go to work and your data goes away. They handle it all, but you can check up on the progress and see who had your data and how detailed and risky it was considered. I couldn't believe how many places had my data, who I had never even heard of. Incogni makes them take it down, and they keep doing it too, making sure that it stays down. Incogni is available risk-free for 30 days, meaning anyone can try it out for themselves and get a full refund if they aren't happy with the service. Use code IsaacArthur at the link in the episode description to get an exclusive 60% off an annual Incogni plan. Go to Incogni.com slash IsaacArthur and take your data back. So that wraps us up for another Sci-Fi Sunday here on SFIA, and we'll be back next month for more on futuristic warfare as we look at cyborg armies and what it might be like to be in one. But before then we have plenty of more episodes to come, starting this Thursday, July 20th, for a look at whether or not alien life forms might be based on ammonia instead of water, and what that might look like. Then we'll continue our look at the future of warfare with dropships and planetary invasions or boarding actions. After that we'll head into August to look at building a space elevator not on Earth but on the Moon. Then we'll head trillions of years into the future to the end of time and the final twilight on the last planet. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also help support the show on Patreon, and if you want to donate and help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service, Nebula, along with hours of bonus content, at go.nebula.tv slash As always, thanks for watching, and have a great week.